Hello to everybody, and I'm really happy that you're here. Uh, although the weather outside is that beautiful, I'm really happy that Vienna, which is my home city, is presenting that nicely to you this year. Well, uh, after these uh, short technical problems, uh, my topic will be to talk a little bit about coronary CTA in uh, the difficult patient with regard, so that means patients with severe arrhythmias and high heart rates. These have been the learning objectives um, as uh, predefined. Uh, it was to understand the criteria for optimal patient selection and preparation to achieve best results, to learn about the acquisition techniques in patients with arrhythmias, and to become familiar with the post-processing techniques available for optimizing the image uh, quality following the scan. Those, I will just start to give you an overview about the relationship between the heart rate and the diagnostic image quality at coronary CT angiography and the importance uh, of uh, lowering the heart rate. And then I will try to give you some tips or thoughts about imaging in patients with high heart rates and in patients with arrhythmia. From the very early beginning of uh, cardiac CT, we know that there is a relationship between the heart rate and the image quality. So if we are taking a look back into the deep middle age of uh, cardiac CT, so just 10 years ago, it has been published that um, we need a really low heart rate uh, to be able to image the coronaries with a good diagnostic image quality. So it was recommended or it was written that the good data can only be confirmed uh, at heart rates below 65 beats per minute, and this paper is about 10 years old. And you can find a lot of papers out from these times uh, coming to the same conclusion. We need a heart rate below 80, uh, 65 beats per minute to be able to image the coronary arteries with, without severe artifacts and to end up with a good diagnostic accuracy. This is just a demonstration on this graph, uh, the strong relationship between the heart rate and the image quality, the higher the heart rate, the lower the image quality will be, and the higher the number of non-accessible segments will be. So we know there is a close relationship between the heart rate and the diagnostic image quality at coronary CT. We know that the coronary arteries are moving uh, during the cardiac cycle. That's clear. And the most important uh, time point for uh, doing the cardiac CT is the mid-diastolic phase, since there is more or less no movement of the coronary segments. However, life is not that easy since uh, all this uh, movement uh, is depending on the heart rate. Again, the uh, higher the heart rate, uh, the higher even the movement of the coronary arteries will be. So this is the example for heart rate below 60 beats per minute. And you can see you have a really long plateau phase in the mid-diastole, so there is enough time to image the coronary arteries without getting any artifacts. But if the heart rate uh, is increasing up to 75, for example, you can see that this plateau phase or this, uh, this uh, rest phase in the mid-diastole becomes shorter and even on a higher level of movement. And if the heart rate is above 75, what you can see here is that uh, this kind of, this, this rest phase is more or less uh, getting lost. Just to demonstrate how important it is uh, to lowering the heart rate and to have a really good temporal resolution. The good news is uh, over the last couple of years, we could uh, uh, observe a really uh, extraordinary improvement in the technical performance of the modern scanners, even uh, showing an uh, excellent improvement of the temporal resolution, starting from the four slice era, starting at a temporal resolution of about 400 milliseconds. We are now dealing with temporal resolutions of uh, below 100 milliseconds, 80 milliseconds, and even, uh, even shorter. So the question is, uh, is this enough? So can we forget all about the heart rate if our scanner is fast enough? And if you look again to the literature, it seems that the answer is still no. The temporal resolution is very, very much important, of course. However, it's not the only thing. We still need to look for lowering the heart rate as well. These are just the very few papers you can find in the literature. Much more papers on that. Uh, Dealing, dealing with the comparison of cardiac CT compared to uh, uh, digital subtraction geography using really modern equipment. The results are pretty beautiful, really high negative predictive values, really high positive predictive values, but all these studies have been performed in a more or less idle, uh, uh, idle patient with a heart rate below 70 or even below 65. So with other words, even in times of ultra-fast scanners, we still need to take care on the heart rate, and heart rate remain a very important factor for the image quality and those for the diagnostic accuracy at coronary CT angiography. 
So we have patients with high heart rates. We have patients where we should do the cardiac CT, how we can deal with uh, this group of patients. Uh, I will first talk about what we can do prior to the scan, Final, uh, afterwards what we can do during scanning, and finally, very short, what we can do after the scan, since after the scan there are not that many options to do if the heart rate was too high. What we can do prior to the scan, if the patient comes in and the high, uh, heart rate is really high, well, we can make it very easy and we can vote for another test. We can say, stop, get out of my room, uh, cardiac CT is nothing for you. Of course, that's an option. Maybe it's not a very good option, and maybe you will end up alone with your scanner and you will not perform any cardiac CT anymore. Another, maybe different option, but at the final end, it, uh, it's a very similar option. You can send the patient back to cardiology, and you can say your colleague from cardiology will improve the situation of the patient, reduce the heart rate, and send the patient back. And I'm quite sure that even this option could be seen as a dead end and could be seen similar to uh, uh, option one if you send... Uh, every second patient back to cardiology. Cardiology uh, will stop sending you patients in the future. So the most important thing is, from my point of view, is you should try to, do, uh, to reduce the heart rate. It's very important in different directions. You can reduce the motion artifacts. Uh, uh, giving beta blockers can help to reach the target heart rate below 65 beats per minute, and there are only very few exceptions for the uh, administration of beta blockers. This is a really uh, uh, excellent paper published in the American Journal of Cardiology 2010 evaluating the role and the efficiency, uh, efficacy of using beta blockers uh, prior to coronary CT angiography, prospective study in more than 500 patients. They found out that 60% of the patients had some kind of contraindications, seems to be really high, and uh, about 50% of the patient had a heart rate above 65 uh, beats per minute when they came in to the CT room. So there is a high demand and lowering the uh, heart rate. Not really surprisingly, uh, they uh, concluded or they, they reported that in patients with absence of contraindications of beta blockers, so in patients receiving beta blockers, the image quality was much better compared to the group of patients with contraindications not receiving any beta blockers. Same results from another uh, uh, study comparing volunteers with patients and again, not really a surprise, the image quality was significantly better in the patient group receiving better uh, a blocker uh, with a significant drop of the heart rate. So better blockers are really efficient in cardiac CT. They can improve your image quality. Next questions, are they safe, the better blockers? Uh, is there any danger to the patient? This is a very good uh, uh, consensus paper uh, from Germany published in Radiology 2010. And they concluded that the beta blockers is the first time treatment to reduce the heart rate uh, in absence of contraindications. A short time, high dose beta blocker administration is safe, and it leads to effective heart rate reduction in the majority of patients. So it's efficient and it's safe. The next question is can we do this alone? Are we allowed to give beta blockers to patients? We are just radiologists. We are just trained to look at images. Are we allowed to give drugs to the patient? Or need we, do we need someone helping us or taking care of us while we are giving beta blockers? The clear answer, again, coming out from this consensus paper uh, out from Germany, of course we can do, this, do that. We are doctors. We are allowed to do that. Beta blockers are safe, and they can be given by radiologists, and they should be given by radiologists during cardiac CT in all the patients in need uh, for lowering the heart rate. So we can do that, and we can do that even by our own. There are some contraindications, of course. In the paper uh, introduced before, the, the, the number of contraindications was 60%. Seems to be really high. So there are new drugs coming out on the market, for example, Ivabradine, and it seems to be a very potential new alternative to metropolol, especially in patients with uh, some contraindications to metropolol. It's a more selective uh, blockade and uh, should be highly efficient. So what we should do uh, prior to the scan is we should try to reach the optimal heart rate. So if the patient comes in, it's very easy. The patient should be stratified in the group, no beta blockers needed, or in the group, beta blockers needed. So if the heart rate is below 65, it's clear the patient has to be moved into the no beta blockers needed group, and we can uh, proceed with the cardiac CT. If the heart rate is above 65%, of course, there is the need for beta blockers, and then we have to go a step further. So we have to decide, beta blockers are needed, of course. We have to decide, can the beta blockers be given? If yes, then they should be given. 
either orally one hour before or intravenously up to 30 mg of metropolol is the maximal dose. There is a problem, of course, if there are contraindications against beta blockers. Maybe we can you go for evaprodine in the future, or we should think about other options, how to deal with this patient, and I will focus on that later on. If the beta blockers are given, there are two options, of course. The target heart rate could be reached, then everything is fine. Then we can proceed with the cardiac CT as normally. But there are still patients, as shown by this paper again, uh, in whom the beta blockade was not sufficient, maybe because not enough beta blockers were given or the reaction of the, uh, uh, of the patient was not, not sufficient. So in this paper, about 60% um, with insufficient beta blockade did not reach the target heart rate. So that means there is a group of patients and there is a group of situations in whom or in which the heart rate can't be lowered, either because beta blockers can't be given or beta blockers are not, cannot be given uh, to, the, to, the, to the maximal rate, or even situations where we cannot think about giving beta blockers. For example, in patients after heart transplantation, in very small children, in emergency situation, or in patients with atrial fibrillations. It's not so good if you have a patient in an emergency situation, critical circulatory status, to start to give them beta blockers. Maybe this could be very dangerous. So there are patients in need for a cardiac CT uh, with high heart rates and some contraindications or beta blockers, uh, or contraindications to beta blockers. So we have situations where we should uh, scan the patients with high heart rates. Of course, we can again con reconsider another test. We can, we can again send the patient back to cardiology. But what we should do in such a situation is to adapt the examination parameters. And this is exactly what we can do during scanning if we are confronted with a patient suffering from high heart rates. First of all, we should select the appropriate scan mode. You know there are right now different scan modes available for cardiac CT. Um, they are different with regard to the, to the sensitivity to pulsation artifacts on the one hand side, but there are uh, much more important differences to the radiation dose. So we can use the retrospective gating technique, which is the technique with the highest dose, or we can use just the step and shoot technique, which is maybe not recommended in patients with high heart rates. The selection of, out of all these scan modes mainly depends on the heart rate, but uh, the selection has a big impact on the uh, radiation exposure to the patient we have a range from 1 millisievert going up to 8 millisievert, depending on the scan mode uh, that we are choosing. Using the retrospective technique is very, very interesting, very helpful, since we get the information from the entire cardiac cycle. We can choose out from a, a huge amount of information. We can take the choice of best quality, since we have the entire cardiac cycle imaged. However, the radiation dose by using this technique is the highest one at the area of 8 to 10 millisieverts. So it's not an option, in my point of view, just to say, well, if the heart rate is a little bit higher, uh, we are just using the retrospective technique, and we will not care about any other options anymore. That's not an option. We should think on different options just uh, to keep the radiation dose low. One very good option is to use the sequence padding technique with slightly enlarged imaging window. Of course, if we enlarge the window, uh, we will increase the radiation dose, but we can very uh, accurately adapt that, and we become more safer uh, against uh, pulsation artifacts, since we have some kind of limited choice of best quality, uh, since we get information uh, from about 50% out of the cardiac cycle. We can even change the direction of the dose modulation. Maybe it sounds a little bit strange, but this might be really helpful. So in normal patients with a normal target heart rate, uh, usually we use a dose modulation and it works like this. Um, the radiation exposure is reduced during the time of the systole since we know that we uh, mainly need uh, the diastolic information. So the typical situation is like here. We have a really good signal-to-noise ratio in the images from the diastole and we have a big background noise in the systolic images. However, it doesn't matter. We don't need usually uh, these images for looking for the coronaries. We need it for functional analysis, and the image quality is uh, still enough uh, for the functional analysis. However, in patients uh, with a high heart rate, it's very helpful to change this direction and uh, to apply the dose reduction at diastole and to use the full dose at systole, doing something like here. 
So we have the noisy image right now from coming out from diastole, and we have the very good image quality coming out from systole. And the background behind this is that uh, shortening the heart rate is always uh, shortening the diastole, and the systole uh, becomes more important. Just two examples, that's the normal way, heart rate 65, and the dose modulation was applied for the systolic images, so we have the noisy images here from systole, and we have the good image quality at diastole. If the heart rate is above 65, in this case it's 82, we have the very good image quality at systole and the noisy images at uh, diastole. So this can be really helpful uh, and uh, can remain uh, the dose really low. We even compared in a very difficult population, the uh, patient after heart transplantation, all of them have a really high heart rate, different scan modes, and uh, a colleague of mine uh, also uh, here in this room, uh, could show uh, that uh, we could reduce the radiation dose uh, significantly by using the sequence mode, by using the padding technique, uh, by remaining the same um, uh, image, uh, uh, image quality, by applying this uh, reversed order of dose modulation. So just one example, patient was scanned in a heart rate between 80 and 95, excellent image quality and no problem in the assessment of the coronary arteries. Of course, there is the question if high pitch acquisition might be helpful. Well, for really assessing the coronary arteries, I don't think so. If you look for the papers, all of the papers were applying the flash technique just in patients with a heart rate below 60. However, there are patients in whom the uh, high pitch technique might be really, really helpful without using the ECG gating. Just two examples, female patient right after coronary bypass graft surgery, still on the intensive care unit and in still a very poor general condition. And there was the question if the bypass are open or if they're uh, uh, getting occluded. Again, the patient was in a really critical situation. The heart rate was below 83 and 97. And we decided not to play around with the beta blockers. It could be dangerous in a patient coming from the intensive care unit. So we used just the high pitch technique without uh, any ECG gating uh, and we were able to demonstrate the patency of the bypass grafts. Of course, the image quality is not, not perfect here, and of course, it's not easy to, to look for the target arteries. However, the bypass grafts could be demonstrated in sufficient image quality. Another example, very small child, a newborn uh, with less than three kilogram, a complex congenital anomaly, and the question was, is there an operation possible, yes or no? And the patient at that age uh, have had a really high heart rate, so it's impossible to lower the heart rate by giving beta blockers down to 70. So we, we used the high pitch technique without ECG gating and uh, could provide really diagnostic images, not with regard to the coronaries, but of course with regard to the cardiac anatomy, showing here the uh, autopulmonary collateral arteries in this patient. And the really good news is that the radiation dose for the total examination was just 10 milligray, uh, the, the dose length product. So a really low dose for the anti-examination. There are even papers uh, talking about systolic imaging and it's going in a similar direction as changing the direction of the dose modulation. That's a paper from, uh, from uh, Korea demonstrating that we can use just a step and shoot technique, but not in diastole as normally, but in systole. And this can be very helpful even in patients with high heart rate and can allow us for really good image quality. What we can do after the scan, not very much. And that's why it's that important to plan your scan properly and to prepare your patient in the right way. Of course, if you're using the retrospective gating technique, you should use all the available data. So you should uh, use the choice of best quality and not always the best systole and the best diastole as provided by the scanner is the real best uh, systole and best diastole. So you should, you should really go through all the phases to find out uh, the phase with uh, uh, the, the lowest number of artifacts. What about patient with uh, arrhythmia? and uh, be sure that's the shorter part of my uh, presentation. Uh, there are softwares for uh, online detection of extrasystole available. They're working pretty fine. So that means that the scanner detect the extrasystole uh, and will not move the, the table, will wait for the next normal uh, heartbeat and will repeat the scan on the same position. So this is very helpful in patient with extrasystole to avoid any artifacts. You can also do a manual editing if you see that there, uh, there have been some ectopic beats during scanning. However, it's very time-consuming, and it's 
just helpful if there's just one or two ectopic beats. It's not helpful if you have a stabilized arrhythmia. So this is one example. Uh, severe ad effect here due to uh, ectopic beat. And after manual editing, it, it becomes a very a beautiful examination uh, with a high diagnostic accuracy as well. What to do with patients with total arrhythmia or atrial fibrillation? Well, there are different reasons why we should uh, investigate this group of patients, even uh, if the heart rate is too high or the, there is the arrhythmia. First of all, newly developed uh, atrial fibrillation could be the first symptom of a coronary artery disease. Before treatment of, uh, of atrial fibrillation, uh, the cardiologists need a morphological assessment of the pulmonary veins. And finally, the rule out of a thrombus within the left atrial appendage is important before resynchronization. So this is such a patient before atrial fibrillation, and this is a very important finding, uh, since uh, we de if we describe an, a thrombus in the left atrial appendage, the resynchronization, the ablation procedure, cannot be performed as planned. Sometimes it's hard to distinguish between filling defect and real thrombus. It's highly recommended uh, to use late phase images to safely distinguish between thrombus and just filling defect in the left atrial appendage. All the other uh, things that are uh, presented before for a patient uh, suffering from high heart rates are hel helpful, of course, even in patients suffering from atrial fibrillation. So you should use a sequence padding technique with an enlarged imaging window. You should change the direction of the dose modulation. Maybe high pitch can be helpful. And you should think about systolic imaging or imaging in the absolute systole. What does absolute systole mean? Well, in normal cardiac CT, we are uh, uh, dividing the RR interval usually in percentages, in steps by percentages, and we define the mid-diastole as around 70%. As mentioned before, if the, uh, if the heart rate changes, if the uh, heart rate increases, the durance of the diastole becomes shorter, so that means 70% of an RR interval is not the mid-diastole anymore. It, uh, it will be uh, much later within the diastole. So one way to go is not to use these percentages, but use absolute numbers. So you're starting with your uh, uh, basic uh, baseline uh, heartbeat, and then you define, for example, that after 750 milliseconds, you will acquire your mid-diastolic images. And this uh, systolic images, uh, this absolute imaging in the uh, absolute systole um, ensures that you're scanning always at the same uh, filling phase of, uh, of your heart. These are the, uh, some examples out uh, from the paper as mentioned. Uh, using the absolute phase can be helpful, especially in patients with arrhythmia. There are some papers describing that uh, using a very fast scanner can be helpful in this patient group. Personally, I don't have experience with the 320 detector scanner, but it has been published uh, two years ago that this might also be an option uh, to treat patients suffering from arrhythmia. Let me try to summarize. Heart rate is a still a crucial factor for image quality at coronary CT angiography. The target heart rate can or should be reached by pharmacological intervention, and lowering the heart rate will improve your image quality and reduce the radiation dose to the patient. However, there are still patients or conditions where lowering the heart rate cannot be achieved. In this case, the systolic dose modulation in combination with a sequence and padding is very helpful, and multiphasic analysis of all available data is highly recommended to improve the quality of your re report. By using the latest ultra-fast generation scanners and the following above-mentioned recommendations, we can still reach a high diagnostic accuracy even in patients with high heart rates or after heart transplantation and even in patients with atrial fibrillation. Thank you very much for your attention.